Welcome to Winners, Wallets, and Worldviews, the only show that's going to teach you how to be somebody. Thank you again. Appreciate your time. We're going to talk about the story of Cypress Semiconductor called Zero to a Billion. And you're not going to make it. It's not like being a star quarterback. You guys are all leaders. You, you guys are trying to crush it. Ladies and gentlemen, whatever's going on in your life, you're going to run into that block. Recognize that you're leaving 95% of American business completely behind. You guys are here learning, getting education. You're going to run into someone standing there. No, no. Michael Jordan's humility is what we're talking about. Saying to you, you're not good enough to get through to the other side. And I say to you, let's roll, baby. Let's roll. And I just want to just kind of catch up a little bit too on like what you've got going on. I mean, yeah, um, you've, you've been, seems like your podcast has been just going out of control with, with growth and all sorts of cool stuff. And you've got a really awesome kind of niche that you talk about with emotional intelligence specifically. And I think that's just obviously one of the most important attributes to kind of rounding yourself off as a, as a person, but also as a business leader, as a leader in itself. So I'm just, how's everything going with you, man? Yeah, thanks, Aaron. So thanks for for having me, uh, first of all. And two, dude, you're just a constant inspiration, man. Just watching all the stuff that you do. You know, there's a verse in the Bible, Proverbs 27, 17, it's iron sharpens iron, big Aaron sharpens big poppy, man. So thank you for... <laughs> For all the iron well, that's what we were, just, we were just talking about this off, off the air a little bit too is 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 it's it's unusual to find the at least in our network this west point network you know the entrepreneurs that lift each other up it always becomes so competitive i you know and and we're not even in competing markets it's just right. it makes no sense to be that way um right. other than just kind of ego yeah right right and and man for me talking about eq here right is is I know for me, dude, I I have the natural tendency to be so prideful and so selfish. Right. And so anything that I can do to actively combat that is is my goal so that I I don't get tempted to get prideful and arrogant and so so I I you know cuz cuz I just you know and the Bible says man pride goes before the fall and and I mean, and you don't need the Bible to tell you that. Just look around, right? It happened. We see it happen yeah. so, so frequently in business and stuff. And so, um, and I think being emotionally healthy and emotionally intelligent, now I can come from a place, a much healthier place in business as an entrepreneur, as a husband, as a father than I ever have before. Four years ago, I ha- I was, I was, man, I've got a whole list actually. I was toxic positivity. Uh, I was emotionally codependent, emotionally needy, um, people pleaser addict. So many, so many different um, dysfunctions that that I have had to overcome, and in some cases still overcoming. Yeah, I've got a list here, Aaron. Let me just show you this list, or I'll, not not show you, but I'll talk through this list here real quickly. So this is just a a small chunk of my emotional dysfunction that I have had to work through and overcome emotionally needy, emotionally codependent, a food addict, a people pleaser addict, a toxic positivity, using positivity as a coping mechanism, chronically late, chronically forgetful, chronically or unorganized, chronic procrastinator, chronic oversleeper, depression, I was suicidal for two years straight, ADD, ADHD, self-condemnation, self-hatred, self-sabotage, insecure, indecisive, no self-awareness, no self-management, hairpin trigger for anger, no boundaries personally or professionally, never stood up for myself, always caved, constantly looking for validation and approval, fear of success, fear of money, praise and hatred were both all consuming, no self-worth and no self-esteem, just to name a few. (laughs) That's a hell of a list. But I mean, I think everybody can, can hear that list and find that there they have those same attributes to varying degrees probably in their life right yeah for sure i think i think there are many that can relate to some degree or another for sure with you know even some of those and so what what you know kind of to sort of where i'm at today so i have been very intensely working on a, a very consistent emotional fitness program uh for the past four years and what has happened as a result of this very intentional emotional fitness program two years into my emotional fitness program all these areas of my life started to change for the better. Uh, my my faith, my marriage, my parenting, my my fitness, my finances, my business, all these different areas. And I'm like, man, has this all been due to my emotional dysfunction and of why I haven't 
made this progress before. And so I told my wife, I'm like, babe, I've got to start a podcast sharing the junk in my trunk and my lessons learned mm -hmm. from my failures, what I'm learning through my emotional growth journey. And because I'm like, I can't be the only emotionally clueless guy out there, right? There's got to be other nobles out there that have been scared to step into this arena, not talk about it, whatever. And so started the podcast and a few months into it, a lot of my buddies, you know, so I've got a few different social circles. So I've got a military circle. I've got, you know, active duty and, and, and retired, you know, veterans and stuff. I've got an entrepreneur circle. I've got a homeschool circle because we homeschool our kid. And then uh, we've been very active in the homeschool community for the last decade. And then, uh, and then uh, business executives, leadership and all that kind of stuff. And so about three to four months into my a podcast i had a number of guys reach out hey dude this is great but like we need gap fillers like we need like more what what else do you have so we started a, a course teaching emotional intelligence an eight-week course teaching you know how to be an emotionally intelligent leader and we had it was a small we the funny thing is as solopreneurs we all our time was to putting the content and the course together we did no marketing so it was literally all word of mouth so we had maybe 15 to 20 folks go through our first course and one of those was a ceo of a company a buddy of mine who he's a took a company in the last 12 years from zero didn't exist 12 years ago to now it's a 300 million dollar international company with a lot of employees and stuff and he went through my my first emotional intelligence course and 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 then and all the other folks went through it too and it was great and everything six months later we did one or two other emotional intelligence courses that kind of trickled, had a, a few folks in it, but it was kind of decreasing in size. So I'm like, man, okay, so the course obviously isn't the way they go. The emotional, the entrepreneur pivot, you got to, you got to pivot as an entrepreneur constantly. So, right. So what we did was, so in, in December of, I don't remember 19 or 20, we're praying, okay, God, man, what do you want us to do with this business? Where's this going? Cause the course isn't really, it was transforming everyone that went through it, but it just, we did do no marketing effort. And so the first, so it ended up being the first week in January, my buddy, the CEO who took the course six months earlier, called me up and said, Hey, Noble, would you be willing to put together an emotionally intelligent leader development program, coaching program for me and my top eight executives of my $300 million company? I said, absolutely. So started that three months later, Another one of my classmates called me up and said, hey, Noble, I just got this leadership consulting contract, coaching contract with this $4 billion company, but I just got hired on as a full-time COO of this other company. I can't fulfill my contract with a $4 billion company. Would you be willing to help me out doing some of the leadership coaching? And can you include some of your emotional intelligence stuff? I'm like, absolutely. So God oh, started yeah. to op open up these <laughs> doors, right? And so, and then since then, through a whole veteran connection, a guy, and this is actually a recent one, a guy reached out to me and said, hey, Noble, I'm following your podcast. I've been watching all your stuff, loving what you're doing with EQ. My company is wanting some emotional, intelligent leadership stuff um, with an emphasis on the, on the EQ piece. Would you be willing to submit a proposal, whatever? I said, absolutely. So I went against a, a big EQ company that has lots of coaches and big company, and it was me. And I met with the president of this division, this $10 billion company and his leadership guy and his COO and just, you know, shared. And one of the questions was, Noble, how, how, you know, what's your qualifications? I said, well, let me rattle off all my emotional dysfunction that I've, <laughs> that I've overcome. I said, that, that's, I don't have a PhD from Harvard in behavioral psychology, right? I, if that's what you're looking for, that's, I'm not your guy. So I, I sh shared all my dysfunction. I said, for the past four years, I've been very intensely working on this stuff. And now I teach it and executive coach, et cetera. And then he said, okay, great. Monday, we're hearing from, you know, a competitor of yours, a big, a big company. And we'll let you know on Wednesday, how it goes. He calls me up on Wednesday. Hey dude, we, we want you hundred percent. And I said, okay, if you don't mind, uh, you know, it's kind of a David and Goliath story. I said, do you mind just sharing why he said, dude, you're those folks showed up in suits and and it was the salespeople. It wasn't the coach or or a coach, salespeople. He's like, dude, you're totally relatable. You speak our language. We we want we want you to to do it. Well, anyway, then check this out. How God works, bro. So he said, I've got forty executives, forty leaders that I want you to start coaching. How do we how do we do how do we do this? 
I said, well, first, let me meet your 40 folks on Zoom because these guys are all over the country. Let me meet your 40 folks on Zoom and let me just do a quick introduction. And he said, I'm just letting you know you are going to have a, a big a, a percentage of these guys that are going to give you lots of pushback and they're not going to want to do this. I said, bro, bring it. Right. That was me four years ago. So like I, I was that guy four years ago that would have said, I don't need EQ. Like I'm 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 totally emotionally intelligent while being totally emotionally clueless. And so he said, all right, I, I don't say I didn't warn you. I said, no sweat. So boom, 40 folks, all these big leaders from all over the country, they jump on and on the call. And I did the same, right? I'm vulnerable. <laughs> so I said, here's all the junk in my trunk. The other guy said, what's your qualifications? I said, all this junk in my trunk. I have a PhD in stuffing and avoiding and you know being emotionally clueless. And I said, but last four years, right? Gave him a whole story. And so, so they're all rolling. They're like, oh, this is going to be great. The guy, again, the guy called me up afterwards and said, dude, the group that we knew was going to give you a hard time, they were rolling. Like they're, they can't wait to, to jump in with this. Wow. And then this guy told me this, he said, Noble, so I'm the president of, of, of my division of this $10 billion company. My boss, who's my boss was on the call. Also, we didn't tell you, but he was on the call. So he wants to, to go through your coaching, get your EQ assessment and stuff and get coached by you. And he said, if it goes well with him, he wants to introduce you to the 47 other divisions of this $10 billion company. And so, you know, so I could, you know, wow, <laughs> you know, just so humbled, made and thankful to be in, in this position for just, I never would have thought, this is how God, I know God has a sense of humor, that the guy who's been emotionally clueless for most of my life, you know, former Army Airborne Ranger from the 82nd and, you know, big bald tattoo guy is now teaching people how to be emotionally intelligent and emotionally healthy. But I tell him, I said, listen, I am still very much on this journey. I, I This is not some from textbooks I read a few years ago. That, like I am on this journey. I'm just maybe a few years ahead of you, four years ahead of you, but like I am still working on stuff, right? This is just like physical fitness is important. Spiritual fitness is important. Why don't most people have an emotional fitness program? Because it impacts every single person, every area of our lives, right? So anyway, that's some of the stuff that God just opened Dude, up lots you have, of you, doors. You have been up to a lot. That's awesome. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that, that is yeah. absolutely awesome. And I'm just when we uh, we we caught up a couple of years back, you know, at one of our conferences, and um, just seeing what you've been able to do with your podcast and the types of guests and the types of you know stories and things that you were able to share has been really really outstanding. So I appreciate you sharing kind of the the latest rundown. Um, but I want to talk, let's go, let's go to the, the, the foundation first of this, yeah. right? So, you know, you look in, if you look at, at data of what makes a person successful, you're going to see, uh, high levels of IQ, high levels of conscientiousness or discipline, or the ability of, you know, finish out a task, um, great, great ability to kind of negotiate and stick up for themselves and, and on their behalf, uh, where, why has EQ come into the mainstream as of late? What is your opinion of where that fits in on the journey to success as a leader, as an entrepreneur, and as a, just a, a family man, whatever you happen to be? Yeah, that's great, Aaron. So, so I'll give you my opinion after I give you some some research here. So, from a book, I know the podcast listeners aren't maybe able to see this, but it's called the Emotionally Intelligent Leader. It's a book by Daniel Goleman. He's one of the OGs of emotional intelligence. He wrote a, a book called Emotional Intelligence, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago. He kind of really helped, kind of brought it into mainstream or helped bring it into mainstream. So this is a book that he wrote from Harvard Business Review and a lot of his articles, a, a compilation of his articles. So check this, check this out. Uh, Harvard University psychologists found that leaders with strengths in a critical mass of six or more emotional intelligence com competencies were far more effective than peers who lacked such strengths. For instance, when he analyzed the performance of division heads at a global food and beverage company, he found that among leaders with this critical mass of competence, 87% placed in the top third for annual salary bonuses based on their business performance. More telling, their divisions on average outperformed yearly revenue targets by 15 to 20%. Those executives who lacked emotional intelligence were rarely rated as outstanding in their annual performance reviews and their divisions underperformed 
by an average of almost 20%. So to, to answer your question, emotional intelligent leadership absolutely affects the bottom line. So it, it, it you know, and it, it, it may feel or sound or seem, you know, abstract and, and, and warm, fuzzy and, and that kind of thing, but it, it absolutely has a direct impact on the bottom line. And for me, what's super fulfilling for me is that it doesn't just make us better executives, better leaders, better entrepreneurs, increase revenue, all that kind of stuff. It also makes me a better husband, a better father, a better you know parent, a better brother, sister, uncle, aunt, etc. Yeah. So okay. So I, I think I'm with you, and I and we you, it's starting to be picked up in MBA classrooms. This is being picked up in a lot of leadership courses. This is the importance of, of emotional intelligence. What are um, you know you you rattled off a lot of you know kind of emotional blocks that you've had to overcome in your day. But what are kind of the key facets to emotional intelligence, um, in, in, at least in, in the view that you teach? Yeah, that's great. So, so I'll give you a couple, a few different answers to that. So, emotional intelligence is the is the ability to get your emotions working for you instead of against you. And emotions are like blood; everybody's got it. You, you there's not even my hardcore logical analytical people. Well, you know, I I I don't, I don't have emotions, or I I shut off my emotions, or my emotions don't affect me. That's all BS. You're just not aware of how your emotions impact you. Mm. Emotions physiologically, physiologically, every decision we make goes through the emotion center of our brain before it ever hits our logical center of our brain. Everybody, it's how how we're wired and designed. So for someone to say, "Hey, it doesn't affect me," is like saying my blood doesn't affect me in what I do every day. That's that's so that's one. So. Number two is emotional intelligence is the ability to, this is Noble's definition now, the ability to acknowledge, identify, process, and manage my own emotions and also the emotions of others. So in a, in a framework, this is, Dan, for now this one is from Daniel Goleman from when he first kind of talked about this, four main areas of emotional intelligence. Now, again, this is the original one. There's a lot more since then, but the basic understanding is self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, and social management. Or it's also talked about as relationship awareness, relationship management, social. So self and social awareness and management are the ways that I like to, to talk about it from a, from a g basic or general standpoint. Now, my EQ assessment that I got certified on covers 15 different areas of emotional intelligence from from five main areas it breaks it down into 15 the reason why why the reason why i like my particular assessment eq assessment is that it covers two of the five big areas that are broken into 15 stress management and decision making which makes it great for leaders it's a great assessment for leaders because every entrepreneur and leader faces you know thousands of decisions every day and lots of opportunities for stress on a fairly regular basis. So those those are kind of how I describe emotional intelligence. There was a, a test we did at West Point uh, when I was a firstie, and it was it was one of the more complicated one. I think it might have been one of the 15 area assessments. And I remember the reading through it and kind of like seeing where my EQ was as a percentile holistically and then what aspects of it. And the one that I stuck out the most was um, I was in the 99th percentile for stress management, which was really wow. interesting that I can handle a really high threshold of stress without wow. it uh, negatively affecting me. There were other problems, obviously, I had in a lot of other areas, um, but we're, but this is my podcast, so I can't talk about my weaknesses. No, they, but but, but I, I think that was really interesting to see all the different aspects to it. Another one that's been pointed out to me um, by my wife, because she's the best at pointing out problems that I have is when, when we're at like social get togethers or whatever, she thinks because I tell really obnoxious jokes or whatever, and uh, that, that, that I'm not aware that it, the joke is going wrong. And I'm like, I'm completely aware that the joke isn't landing, but the management, I can't do anything about it. Like I am totally aware of a situation, how everybody's feeling and reacting to it, 
but I can't do anything about it. So like my awareness is fine, but my management is low. And I, I wanted to kind of get your opinion on kind of breaking down those different areas, you know, the difference between self-awareness, self-management, um, kind of the connection with the other people as well. That so that that's that's great awareness. <laughs> that, that's a, <laughs> yeah. right? the fact that you're aware of that that's excellent, and 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 even kind of how you talked about that was was also great, and and I would say is is very very normal. Everybody, just about everybody that I've worked with, you know, and I've I've got seventy five coaching clients right now, um, and so we, and I've been coaching for many many years, and and. I have not met anybody yet that is great at all four. Typically, we have one or two of those areas that we're great at, one or two of those areas that we're not not great at. And, and I'll give you a perfect example. So me, so I, I was completely clueless with my self-awareness and even my self-management. But my social awareness and my social management were pretty high but for unhealthy reasons. Because I was a people pleaser addict, I was constantly hyper aware. Oh, well, what did, what did Aaron's eyebrow just do right there? Oh, what does yeah, that mean? Right. Well, does he like me? Does he not like me? Is he right? I was constantly seeking validation and approval from everybody. So I got really good at reading the crowd, reading the audiences and stuff. But again, for, for unhealthy reasons, but I had very little, if any, self-awareness and self-management. That's really interesting. I mean, talk about the people pleaser uh, side of you and how you recommend dealing with that. Um, because I think that a lot of people run into that issue, right? There's kind of like a couple extremes. There's the, and, and I'll just put these into two buckets because I think this is where most people fall is they don't give a flying crap what other people think at all. And then there's the other side that they care too much what other people think. Um, walk me through those kind of two personalities. Yeah, that's great. So so again, I'm going to use me as the example. Uh, so I call myself the dirty underwear leader, right? I, I'll share my racing stripes of all of my junk in my trunk and <laughs> and my dysfunction and stuff. So, so my, and I'm I'm thankful for my parents here, but but I'm going to talk about an area where they were not super great, and they have many great qualities and characteristics. This is an area that they weren't, and it had an impact, had a consequence. One of the things I say is, no one leaves their childhood unscathed. No one leaves their childhood unscathed, and Lottie Dottie, everybody develops our emotional foundation in our childhoods mm -hmm. whether good bad whatever if you had leave it to beaver childhood or jerry springer childhood bottom line jerry is we all, right? <laughs> we all develop our emotional foundations right in our childhood so for me uh, my my dad was super chill he was an er doctor for 30 some years until he died uh 13 years ago my mom is she taught spanish at oklahoma university and so she so she raised me speaking spanish and in our house, so as early as I can remember, we would yell and scream at each other when we, to deal with conflict, we'd yell and scream. Whoever yelled the loudest won, we'd stomp off into our respective corners of the house, come back and act like nothing happened. So there was zero conflict resolution skills that, that I learned. And I also learned from, again, from the jump, how to stuff and avoid my emotions. And what happens is when, if our, if, if we, we you had a childhood like me, that we never got our emotions validated or affirmed in our childhood, that leads to a truckload of consequences as an adult. In my case, how that played out was that that turned into a hardcore people-pleasing addiction because I'd never got my emotions validated as a child. I tried to get them validated by everyone else around me as I got older, which turned into a hardcore people pleasing addiction. And what's crazy is I didn't even know I, I had that I was a people pleaser addict until four years ago when I started this emotional growth journey and, and started to, to discover the something I like to call is the emotional origin stories. We talk about, hey, what's the emotion, what's the origin story of Superman, of Wonder Woman, of the Incredible Hulk, right? The origin story of superheroes. Well, we all have emotional origin stories. We all have or emotional origin stories of every behavior that we do, mm -hmm. productive or unproductive, healthy or unhealthy. And so once I started to discover all these um, unhealthy emotional origin stories, I, I was able to start working on them, healing them, growing through them and stuff. And, and, and I started to realize, man, 
have I been a people pleaser addict this whole time? I was reading this book by, oh man, you'd know him. He's a, he was like the hall of fame guy, football guy. He was a football coach for Florida a handful of years ago. Urban Meyer. Urban Meyer. That's it. Urban Meyer's book. And, and he said, you know, one of the middle of the book, he's like, yeah, my personal leadership philosophy is this. And I'm like, he, he has a personal leadership flash. Like what, what on earth, why is that so shocking to me? And the reason it was so shocking is because I've never had my own leadership philosophy because I've been a people pleaser addict. So if I was around Aaron long enough, Oh, well, I'm going to adopt Aaron's leadership philosophy because you know, man, he must know what's going on. And I want, I want him to like me. So I'm going to write mm, Oh, West yeah. point. Oh, well, West point says, this is what a leader is. So man, West point, they they've got to be right. So I've got to take Oh, the 82nd. Oh, the 82nd leadership. I never had developed my own leadership philosophy because I was a people pleaser addict. So as I started to get healthier emotionally, I started to realize how exhausting it is to, to live where every single decision I made was trying to seek out the approval uh, uh, and validation and affirmation of other people around me. And, and so that's why I say, so, so many successful people, Aaron, that I've coached and worked with and stuff, so many of them are successful for unhealthy reasons. Now the other spectrum, so the other spectrum for folks that, Hey, screw you. I don't care what you say. Again, a which lot you of get times, a lot of in the entrepreneur space, right? You absolutely. get a lot, you get a lot of the like F the system, be my own boss, whatever. I don't care what you think. And it's like, well, now you're out of touch too. So there's an that, issue here. That's exact. So again, let me use me as an example. So in my, in my EQ assessment, this, the one that, that I've got is the 15 things. One of the 15 areas of, of, of emotional intelligence in this particular assessment is independence. Well, my independence was, was almost off the charts. And I'm like, as a people pleaser addict, that's really weird that I would have hardcore independence because I am, I am that guy that you just shared. Screw the system, screw rules. Don't try to tell me what to do to, to a, a, a fault. And so I'm like, man, what, God, where is that coming from? Like, what, why am I so hardcore against the system? And, and check this out, dude, this was life changing for me. When I, as early as I, and again, I I love my mom. I'm so thankful for my mom. This was just another consequence, another area, right. That, that, that was created as early as I can remember, my mom took, dude, I'm not exaggerating. 15 to 20 pictures of me every single day of my life, every (laughs) single day of my life. When we went out into public, you know, she, my mom's a hardcore extrovert. We would meet strangers in the, in the restaurant, every restaurant we went out to after dinner, whatever she, she would pose me with these strangers and my family, dad and my sister and stuff with these strangers stand here. Oh, no, 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 stand over here. No, 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 stand. And, and dude, I'm wanting to crawl under the chair, right? Cause these strangers like who on earth are you people? Who is this lady? Why are we getting a picture with this family? And it, my, mom's telling us what to do, right? Every single day of my life. That's what I remember. And so it, it created such a, an, a significant emotional thing in me that I, anybody who tries to tell me what to do. It's it's a it's a visceral response. Mm. I'm going to do the complete opposite because I got told what to do in in emotionally and socially very embarrassing awkward situations. No, I what I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do. I'm doing the opposite. Right now, check this out. This is how this stuff gets generational, bro. It used to drive me nuts. Where I was so I was pissed. I was upset that my mom would do this until I finally discovered why she, why on earth, mom, are you taking so many freaking pictures? I had a sister who was four years older than me. When, when, I don't think I've ever shared this on a podcast. When, when my sister, so my, my sister was, was five months old and my parents went on a date night, they dropped off my sister whose name, well, so dropped off my sister at a, at the babysitter. The babysitter had a five-year-old kid boy who kicked her in the chest and killed her when she was five months old. They come back from the date night or they got a phone call, obviously come back and of course their daughter's dead. And so it took them four years before they, they finally had me. Well, the mindset of my mom is I want to, I don't know 
if my son's going to get killed or die, or I want to capture as many memories as I can of my son while I've got him. Cause I don't know how long he's going to be with me. So, but of course I didn't know that when I was a kid at right at every age, but that's, that's how stuff gets generational, how our emotional issues get transferred into, into the next generation. Wow. Wow. That's crazy. I, I mean, that's a, it's wow. That's a, that was a heavy story, brother, but the, but it's, it's weird. I mean, I can see how you start to compound these beliefs and these mechanisms since, since your childhood. Um, and I, and I'm watching my son who's 11 months old now and everything he learns is through a lens created by me and my wife. And it's, you can see how this has happened, how this happens over time. Uh, the words that he's learning are from stuff I'm saying. Um, so this is every single thing he's learning he, and believing to be true is coming from me. So I can see how impactful uh, your family relationship is, the environment around you, and how this can start to uh, you know create the 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 decisions and the emotional behaviors that you start to live with as it goes on, which is really interesting. Um, what I'm kind of curious about is when you're starting to kind of work with a person. And you're starting to get into their background, their their you know what kind of trauma they may have or have not had, and and how you can coach that through. Because what I look at is the the classic question: nature, nurture, right? Is a leader can the EQ be made, or are you born with it? Um, where do you stand on that spectrum? Is it a mix of both? What do you think? Great question. So, so it's, it's both, it's both because, so a couple things. So again, no one leaves our, our childhoods unscathed. How many of us are trained on how to work with, interact with, deal with, learn from our emotions? 99% of people are not. Now it's it, like you said, it's getting more popular, getting more mainstream. So, and like when our, when our daughter was four, we started to teach her. I said, we, my wife started to teach her some really great emotional skills, emotional tools, mm -hmm. uh, which have been life changing now that she's our daughter's 14. And it's been life changing for me also that if, if I had not started my emotional fitness journey four years ago, there's no doubt in my mind to be paying for my daughter's therapy right now yeah. because of all my emotional dysfunction. So, so yes, we, the more intentional you are as a parent to, to obviously teach, coach and train and mentor your children to be emotionally intelligent, that's going to be massive. So that nurture, that intentional nurture is going to be massive in impacting their, their, their adulthood and their, the rest of their life. Sure. Now, the other factors, when I coach somebody, there's there's a lot of things that I'm looking at. And again, I, I'm not, so disclaimer again, I'm not a psychologist, psych, psychiatrist, all that kind of stuff. I have been a very intentional people stutter, people studier for four decades and have read probably a thousand books on people and leadership and all that kind of stuff. And the things that are, that EQ impacts and, well, the EQ impacts our personality, strengths, love languages, right? Are just ju uh, just to name a few. So you can have so an emotionally healthy. Th so there there are spectrums of emotionally healthy versions of your personality and emotionally unhealthy versions of your personality. So for example, for me. As an extrovert, and you know what, you know you Myers Briggs or DISC or whatever, whatever the model is. So, so I'm high I influencer and dominant, and, or it's called a sanguine choleric using the other personality plus model. Yeah, DISC or, is the I D. -S -S yep. -S -S yep. D I S C. Yep. So dominant influencer, steady conscientious. So I I'm high influencer and dominant, but because I was emotionally unhealthy my I and D were coming from very emotionally needy places. Mm -hmm. So I had, so that looked, so am I still ID? Yes, I'm still ID, 
but I'm, I'm a much emotionally healthier a, a, a version of that now because I'm not emotionally needy like I used to be. Now, not that I've arrived, not that I'm emotionally healthy, but I'm emotionally healthier. And so sometimes some, so when, I'm, when I'm coaching somebody, their personality is is getting impacted by is is exacerbated right so their strengths and weaknesses can be see, exacerbated yeah. right by their level of emotional health and emotional intelligence in in addition to their strengths so so strengths finder 2.0 i'm sure you probably heard of that right yep. um great tool i use that a lot of my my coaching clients as well gallup poll it's a you know big big uh, organization and my so so shockingly my, my number one strength is called woo which is winning others over so i'm the guy that has never met a stranger i, I can connect very easily rapport builder etc cetera, etc cetera. but because I, when i was emotionally unhealthy my woo was off the charts right it, it would my i was so I, I would attempt to win others over so much that it would shut them off mm. right it would turn them off so Every strength can be a weakness if you're not emotionally healthy, coming from an emotionally healthy place. I think right? that makes so, a lot. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. And if you think about it in the in the aspect of stress, for example, um, how you respond to stress, and if you are not trained on managing your emotions under a stressful circumstance it becomes very easy to let that kind of negative side of you out. But if you are trained in understanding on how to manage a stressful circumstance, it's very different. Um, I've never really seen my wife stressed until we had a kid. Cause you know, like a baby, you know, you have a baby falls down, hits his eye and all of a sudden it's bleeding. And uh, she called me in just this absolute panic, but we had gone through a lot of just kind of like stress management and tools, like just as part of West Point being in the military, just in life. And, uh, I was able to kind of like, I was concerned. It's my son too. I thought I was going home to a kid with a missing eye and all of a sudden, uh, but you know, you just kind of come back to reality. Okay. Let's get the facts in order. What needs to happen? You know, it turns out he bumped his head. He got a cut by his eye. Facial bleeding happens a lot. And it's just kind of, you rule these things out. But I think the, the point of that story is that by eight, by understanding how I might naturally react to a stressful circumstance and having the tools to combat that with a productive strategy to re respond to stress is extremely helpful. And I think stress is a great example to talk through for exactly the point that you just made. So, so you just great, great point. So there's a whole nother aspect of emotional intelligence that is called emotional agility. And there's a, there's a book by Susan, Susan David, it's called emotional agility. And what's what's really interesting is that she doesn't really mention the perspective that I that I come from, uh, which is interesting. I love to talk to her sometime at some point. But the healthier that I've gotten emotionally, the, the more the yeah, the healthier I've gotten emotionally, the the more emotionally agile I am. The the, the other dynamic is which, which which also the other pack. So so not only my emotional agility has increased. My emotional bandwidth has increased. My emotional capacity has increased. My emotional endurance has increased, which another way to say this, resilience has increased as I've gotten healthier emotionally and which impacts leadership, agility, et cetera. So if you were to graph my emotions four years ago, it would have looked like an EKG monitor, right? Mm -hmm. in, in, in five minutes, I would have, I could have gone Hulk mode. I could have started crying. I could have been happy. I would have experienced the whole spectrum in five minutes. Now, if you were to graph my emotions, it would look like a sine curve. So I, I'm much more emotionally stable. I'm much more emotionally predictable. Not that I don't experience highs or lows, but they don't impact me like they used to. Emotions don't impact me like they used to. It, it's So now, rather than, than it being my identity, I am angry. I am sad. I am scared. I am fearful. No, that's an identity statement. It's I feel scared. I feel uh, 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 sad, mad, whatever. So, 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 because when you make it an identity, your identity, man, it 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 consume. It's all consuming. It it all it was all consuming me. Now it's something. It's it's something that I experience. Something that happens to me. It's information. It's data. It's not my identity. So, when when like you said, as you get healthier emotionally. You, you can now allow 
emotions, and I call it your emotional balance sheet. Once you learn how to read your emotional balance sheet, your emotional yeah, right, your emotional yeah, dashboard. Like it, it reminds me of what a, a great um, I don't remember who it was, but a, a good leader told me one time that you want to be able to observe your emotions, not let them control you. So it, it would, but like you don't necessarily shut them away or anything, but you recognize I'm feeling grief right now. Um, Boom. I'm going to take some time to process this, and instead of like just bawling or being or mourning or whatever you're doing, understand, okay, I'm not going to make any hard decisions for a few months as I'm dealing with this, like simple things like that to where you recognize the state you're in. And it's just like you said, reading the balance sheet, like it's just observing the different emotion that's happening. Um, and kind of, and that allows like this buffer, I compare it to two kind of areas. So like when I was, uh, I played football at army. So when I was watching, I, we watched film all the time in a game, right? Or of our practice of game foot film all the time uh, to the point where every time I would try to watch a football game in the NFL or just to enjoy, I would have two modes I would watch the game in. I would either just watch the game and have a good time like you're drinking a beer or I'm analyzing the game um, and I couldn't really even see what was happening. I couldn't really watch the game as a normal person watching it. I was always analyzing every detail. And I, the same thing would happen with music where sometimes I'm listening to music and I, I play guitar. So like other times I'm trying to pull apart the sounds of the song, see how it's all coming together. And I think that the latter is a good way of thinking of your emotions, like understanding what's going on with them instead of just letting them drive you, letting you react to something. If you're angry, understanding that you're angry, understanding that what's going to be productive out of this anger versus what's just me just letting this feel good. Um, and I think that's that's how I've tried to think of it. I think that's exactly what you're talking about when you're talking about reading this balance sheet. Excellent analogies, Aaron. Excellent analogies. And that is a, a very emotionally intelligent way to describe how we should a- approach, deal with, interact with our emotions. It's it's watching game film of yourself. It's watching game footage of how you interacted in that situation, almost from a, a, a third party perspective. Okay, wh- how did I respond there? How did that person respond? What was I feeling at the time? Right. That, it, but it takes a lot of awareness to be able to do that. You you said it very well, which tells me that that you 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 do that. Me, that would have been space science fiction stuff if I had talked to you and you told that to me four years ago. I'd have been like, dude, I have no idea what you just said, right? Because I was so detached from my emotions. I never let myself feel or express emotions at all. Or if I did express emotions, it was very inappropriately because I had no, again, self-management. And so you're exactly right. The other thing too is that a lot of people get you know, mistaken is that it's there, there are no good and bad emotions. It's all data. It's a, a financial statement, right? Okay, so there's, so, so you know, maybe you're in the black, maybe you're in the red, it's, but it's data. So now if you know that you're in the red, okay, well, now we need to know, okay, which line item, where am I at? What needs to be, where do I need to dial in? It's again, it's just data. It's not, oh man, it's, it's good numbers or bad numbers. It's, it's just numbers. And yeah. now it should impact how we make decisions going forward, but we should not, you know, we've got to be careful. You said this also in your, one of your comments, I was really smart is that what are the stories we have, the stories and beliefs we have about emotions picking that apart like game film i love that analogy is is a way to to really what is your worldview what are your thoughts about emotions and feelings if you have a negative worldview because of your childhood or or a loved one or something you know uh, gave you some trauma or whatever you may think that emotions and feelings are bad well there again it's just data and if you continue to run from and avoid that data on your financial statement how can you improve your financial statement if you don't if you're not willing to look at it you know what i mean yeah 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 and i think i mean and and um that's it's just a great a great way of thinking of it because i mean you're never going to separate the feeling you have but you might be able to separate the response to the feeling right um i mean i'm i'm never going to be able to not laugh at something that's funny, you know, but I can hold something in, in a certain situation, or if I'm grieving, there's a, there's a response that is within control, but how I react is different. I think if you can look at it like game film, like you're saying, and and looking at it, like it's just this data, it allows you to respond before you just allow it to kind of take you over and control you. 
it's like the incredible hulk kind of situation right bro so i've I've got a story that is just it will dial this this point home and so i was this is four years ago this is one of the this is one of the three things that happened to me that got me into the space a lot of people say dude how did you get in the space this is one of the things that got me in the space so my daughter was 10 so four years ago daughter was 10 we're in the living room in uh, hope mills outside of fort bragg uh and in our this big living room it had a skylight on it we was like six seven o'clock in the night it was starting to, to, to get dark and i don't know and we're just having a regular family conversation i don't remember it was just something random hey what are we doing tomorrow or just something random all of a sudden the 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 the, the, the bottom drops out of the clouds it's raining cats and dogs like thunder lightning boom out of nowhere my daughter goes from a zero to a 10 emotionally i i had no idea i, I had no idea what was going on guess what happened to me because i had no self-awareness no self-management i immediately went to a 10. Mm. so i immediately go went from, went from bruce banner to incredible hulk in 0.3 seconds and and like where i started to sh- i was shaken thank god by god's grace man i walked 10 feet into our bedroom bedroom door or bedroom closed the door locked it behind me and sat on my bed and i was i was like I was freaking out and I had no idea why, but because my daughter went to a 10, I immediately went to a 10. A couple minutes later, my wife got my daughter calmed down, knocks on the door, let her in. She stands in the corner away from me because she knew when Noble's in Hulk mode, like don't, don't poke the bear. Mm -hmm. Started to calm down and she said, Hey Noble, Hey bro, I want to give you some skin. And she said, do you know that you can be, because I I was, dude, I was terrible. I was, so number one, I was, I was, I was, I was an emotional 10. I was freaking out and, and, and I was angry and rage because I was terrified of what I could have done if I stayed in that room. There, there is no doubt that if I went Hulk mode in front of my daughter and my, my wife, I'd be paying for the therapy right now. I, I, I thank God that again, however, he, he got me into, into my bedroom and, and, and locked me in there. But I was terrified of what I could have done, what I was capable of. And my wife said, Noble, once I started to calm down, do you realize that you can behave differently than how you feel? And my head exploded. I'm like, that, I laughed at her. I'm like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. That's not possible. You can't do that. She said, Noble, you can't do that. But a lot of, I can, and there's a lot of other people that can separate their emotions from how they behave. And I'm like, well, I, that that sounds great, briefs well. I have no idea what you're talking about because when I feel an emotion, you're gonna, everyone's gonna know it, right? But that mm. was because I was emotionally clueless at the time. So what you're saying is so true. We can, we have the capacity to separate the stimulus from our response, from our behavior, but it takes emotional fitness and emotional health to be able to do that because there's a lot of us again me four years ago who who didn't have that capacity or ability until i started to get emotionally healthy in a lot of ways i think uh good leaders do that um where they have to kind of fill the void of where the emotion of the team or the unit or the organization needs to go uh you think of a, a football coach if the locker room's totally dead before a game well, they have to bring the emotion and the energy as a way of showing the team this is the energy we need. Maybe after a game, everybody's down and they have to bring this positive outlook. Um, and, and you see that all the time, I think, in leadership where great leaders have a way of separating what their personal feeling is in the moment and being able to kind of act in such a way and behave in such a way to kind of fill that void. I think that's a, it's a, it's, a wonderful way that you kind of put it is is behaving differently than you're feeling, uh, which is really helpful. I wanted to ask you another um, kind of topic in the EQ family, and something I think you're really good at. And I think you know, as as people are entrepreneurs and sales professionals, is the idea of charisma, and and how kind of the general world around charisma, how you can break that down and improve upon it. Talk to me a little bit about uh, what people can do for, for things like charisma. That's a, that's another great question, Aaron. So, and I, I've thought quite a bit about this. So, so charisma, 
Now, now part of it is, is, you know, cause some people ask, like, I am a hardcore extrovert and I popped out of the womb like this, bro. Like I've always been kind of wired for, for, for people. But again, for most of my life, it's come from a very unhealthy place, right? It was mostly needy, all that kind of stuff. But what I've realized about charisma is that the more you can become authentic, which, which requires self-awareness and self-management, the more our, our, core values align with our thoughts align with our beliefs align with our actions align with our words the more that that spinal column can align when our back is aligned the the more effective the more powerful the more impactful we're going to be in the interactions that we have with other people the more charismatic we are going to be and again, I'm not saying uh, that's got to be a certain personality because I think extroverts, introverts can be charismatic, but it comes, in my opinion, it comes from that spinal column being fully aligned. But again, it takes it takes coming from a very authentic place. And based on my experience now being in the CQ space for a couple of years, there are a lot of people who don't really know who they are because they haven't taken that intentional time to reflect, pray, meditate, journal. Mm, yeah. What, what what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? What are and, and I love what you said. You, you it's not it's not dismissing these maybe potentially unpleasant emotions or these unpleasant characteristics or weaknesses. It's not dismissing them and pretending that oh I don't have these. No no it's it's listen we all have strengths we all have weaknesses we all have. It's, it's embracing all of it. That's that's coming from a truly authentic place. And the more you can, you can again, increase that self-awareness, increase that understanding of who you are and who God made you to be, introvert, extrovert, uh, uh, whatever the different, all the different qualities and characteristics you have, the more you can, can, can understand, acknowledge, identify, embrace, and own all of that, strengths and weaknesses all all of it the more authentic you can be and the more you can show up as you not trying to be well crap i want to be as successful as aaron so yeah, i need I, to I, be like aaron no i think you're completely right i think you know there's but there's i think there's a couple of precursors to getting there first right so um for example the entry level sales charisma training is kind of to find like ground with somebody right so, so, so there's that. I think there's there's an, an interesting point to it. But I think that the immature person will try to just, you know, people please their way into that, right? Like, oh, you like cars. Now I'm going to be a car guy for now. Or it's like, oh, you're into uh, sports. So I'm going to be a sports guy today. Or you're into this political view. So I'll just, and then he's kind of chameleon. I think that's kind of this like more immature way. But I think you're describing is um, having the confidence, which would be the precursor to be able to be authentic but still find that like ground with people. So it's like, Oh, you're into cars. It's like, but like we can have a playful, but then they they're into, you know, 69 Corvettes and you're just like, well, you know, you know, that's a crap car. You can have almost because you're in line with your views, you're confident. It becomes a much deeper bond, I think with each other because you are confident enough to hold the position. Bro. So, so you, 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 uh, and I love, I love that perspective that, okay. So look, you can, there are people, and I've met them out there. There are people, and I've met some West Pointers like this. There are people out there who learn emotional intelligence and people skills and charisma as a transactional tool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But you can sniff that out in a in a skinny instant yep. when you're emotionally healthy. I don't have to pretend to be charismatic or I'm not trying to use it as a tool to get to Aaron to, to do a business deal. No, no, no. I, I'm going to be me and I can be interested in what Aaron is interested in because I'm genuinely interested in him and I'm secure in my own stuff. I don't, I don't need to, I don't need to one up you. I don't need to, Oh, I, I, I think that's, I, I think real estate's a terrible idea, Aaron. I, I, why can't I just be interested in what Aaron's interested in? 
Why do I have to feel the need to to one up or, well, let me tell you what, let me tell all my good stuff, Aaron. Why, why do I have to do that? Why do I have to, just like we talked about at the beginning, why do I have to feel like I have to compete with Aaron? Why can't I let Aaron, if I'm secure in who I am and who God's made me to be, why can't I let Aaron be be whoever Aaron is? And Yeah, appreciate the beauty about, in that person. Yes, that's right. I found that's I right. found actually doing that to a fault is a problem too, where I'm being really interested in somebody else and then getting into conversations you can never get out of. So like, uh, we're like, you know, the other person's, yeah, it's, you know, you're, you're making it about them and it's exciting and, and you're actually kind of interested in what they're doing, but there's no way we're going to get out of this conversation and the amount of time that we really have allocated. <laughs> I found, I found the, the opposite side of that to be a problem in some cases, but yeah. Um, well, well, I, I think that uh, the idea of charisma is really interesting. And one thing I've noticed about you, and, and I've told people this before, when um, when they're trying to figure out what makes what makes someone likable, and I'm like, well, think about like, why do you like your dog? And uh, well, you like your dog because your dog is jumping up and down when you come home, excited to see you. Uh, imagine if every time you meet someone or see someone again or something like that, you greet them with the intensity that your dog greets you when you come home from a long day imagine how big of a difference that could make for somebody they're going to be super jacked to see you every single time because it's just like you give them a big freaking bear hug and it's just like hey come on and that is i think one tiny itty bitty little thing every single person could do and it would night and day change uh their perception that they have around you Yes, absolutely. I mean, think about when we jumped on the absolutely. call, man. I thought that you were going to jump through the freaking computer at me, you know. And it's just like you just brought so much intensity and energy. I think to the to how excited you were to really be there to see someone, and it felt so real. And I mean, it was real. And I think that that's that's something that other people can do. Well, anyway, what, what's like a which what's kind of like your last little tip that you can give people who are just kind of discovering this EQ space. Um, what's like, wh where's the entry point that they can start to get some good information? Yeah, that's great. Great question. So let, let me, let me do a couple quotes and then I'll, and then I'll, I'll hit that. One is if you don't deal with your emotional issues, your friends, family, and coworkers will be forced to. Fact. If yeah. you don't deal with your emotional issues, your friends, family, and coworkers will be forced to. The next thing is emotionally healthy people help heal other people emotionally. So this journey, so what I would say is, this journey is so incredibly rewarding, fulfilling, and impactful and carries with it tangible, concrete outcomes and results, personally and professionally. Mm -hmm. Now, it can be scary, it can be hard, it can be terrifying. The outcome is so worth the, the, the journey. And the only way to emotional health and emotional freedom is, is through some of that tough emotional stuff and emotional work that, that is required to get, to get to, the, to the outcome. But the cool thing is, so now to your point, where would I where would I start folks at is that so so is to understand that you are in complete control of your emotional fitness program. So if, if you're new to this space, you do not have to run an emotional marathon tomorrow. Oh, man, this sounds great. Noble. Let me jump in all the trauma that I've had as a kid. Let me, let's go tomorrow. Okay, I, I don't recommend doing that. <laughs> and, and if you need right, if you need help, seek a professional, go find a psychologist, psychiatrist, a therapist, a counselor, something like that, that can help you with some of those big things. I recommend starting with some baby stuff. Hey, me and my wife argued over where we were going to go to dinner last night. Just start start with some baby emotional stuff that is not super catastrophic and super traumatic. Just just let's start with some base hits. Let's just let's just work on building up set. Just start with the with a 10 pound dumbbell, emotional dumbbells. Don't don't throw on the the Aaron Armstrong weights yet. I start with the the noble weights, man, where you got to start with some baby steps, some 10 pounders, <laughs> right? <laughs> let's not go to the 100 pound dumbbell curls right now. So and, and how do you do it? So, so a lot of people are like, okay, well, how do you do that? Okay, so two, I got a few different ways to do that. Number one is go to Google and print out emotion wheel. You can print out an emotion wheel, 
put it on your desk, put it on your refrigerator at home and start growing your emotional vocabulary. People that have a greater vocabulary to describe emotions have a higher emotional intelligence. Me four years ago, I had three or four words. That's about all angry, sad, happy, and mad was about all I had. Now I've, I just did a, one of my emotional exercises on, on, I was having a tough time with my daughter growing up. She's 14, going to be out of the house in a few years. And, and I wrote down 55 different emotions off the top of my head. That's, that is a miracle and proof that God exists, man. If I went from four emotional words to 55 in one, describing one experience I was going through, that is a massive proof of growth for me. So, so start emotion wheel. The second thing I recommend from all my coaching clients is download an app called mood meter mood meter. I don't know whose it is. It's 99 cents on the app store, but that's like the app version of the emotion wheel. And it, it takes 15 to 20 seconds to check in with yourself. Okay. Where am I at? How am I feeling? Why am I feeling this? It takes 15 to 30 seconds. You, and I, so the easiest way to start a habit is attach it to a habit you've already got. So I recommend before you eat or, or before you go to work or before you go home, attach it to a habit, just take 15, 30 seconds, plug, you know, do your app thing, fill it in mood meter app, just to check with yourself. And that will help begin growing people's self-awareness and also even into a little bit of the self-management stuff. Okay. That's the second thing. The third thing is listen to check out my podcast, listen to other podcasts, other content that's talking about emotions and emotional intelligence. For me, I had no concept when you said, Hey, I'm going to sit in my emotions. I'm going to process it. I, I had no idea what that meant four years ago. What does it mean to sit in my emotions and process it? I don't even know what that meant. So you've got to just start getting familiar with the vocabulary of emotional health and emotional intelligence. And a great way to start that again is just by checking out some different podcasts and stuff that talk about emotional health and emotional intelligence. So where can they listen to your show? EQGangster.com is the website. EQ Gangster is the podcast, is the YouTube. It's it's on, I think, all the major platforms, the podcast platforms out there. And okay. then I'm all the I'm all, all the social media, uh, social media stuff as well. And then we have a, a membership group for those folks that are wanting to grow in community, kind of have an emotional fit, like a CrossFit gym, a CrossFit box, right? A workout gym. This is kind of my workout gym, emotional workout gym. It's called the EQ Mafia. We got a bunch of content in there, a bunch. It's a it's our membership. So, uh, but EQGangster.com, you can find out all the skinny. Noble brother, it's always a pleasure catching up with you, man. Um, I just, I, I appreciate you. I appreciate what you're doing. I know that a lot of the, your kind of teachings and lessons has come from your own personal and professional growth. Um, I know you're a man of faith and I just, I appreciate having you on today. And I appreciate, I hope that the listeners got some awesome golden nuggets uh, learning about EQ from you. Big Aaron, thank you, bro. Always <laughs> great to see you, dude. Thank you for being an inspiration and example in business and life, man. Totally appreciate you, brother. All right. Well, you guys are listening to Winners, Wallets, and Worldviews podcast about business, leadership, and life. Go out there, peace out.